So welcome everyone to this first session, Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases. And thank you for registering already on the LEARN portal and also uh, joining our webinar today. And hopefully everybody that has joined has shared their uh, background information in the recent poll that Sonalika shared. So a little bit about the program before I start today's session. Today's session will be a glimpse of what kinds of topics and projects we're going to be focusing on throughout the program, but also we'll do some hands-on exercises that everybody can uh, learn from about next generation sequencing data analysis. Overall, the program is going to be focused on viral, bacterial, and parasite uh, infections and the host response to those infections. And we're going to be looking at bioinformatics methods that will allow us to study these topics. So Bioinformatics for Infectious Diseases is an online training program. We've done it already several times, but I think that the, relevant, the relevancy of these methods is increasing and not decreasing. So we're excited about many of you joining this program and hopefully today's session will give you a clear understanding of how this program will work. So as a result of this program, you will be able to understand the pathogens from a genomics perspective, uh, being able to identify them in animal reservoirs, vectors, and hosts, and understand how to apply analysis methods to study viral evolution, replication, and adaptation. And then we'll also talk about bacterial and parasite infections and how they are different from viral infections, as well as how we can apply some similar methods to study them and understand their complexity of the infection that they cause and the variation in the disease as a result of that infection. We'll talk about how to detect viral genomes in next generation sequencing data. So we'll look at methods today where we can take next generation sequencing data of all RNA or total RNA, and then identify specific pathogens and also validate that we are indeed finding viral genomes. <clears throat> we'll talk about different strains and haplotypes, how to determine what kinds of genomes we are finding. We'll also talk about the application of such methods to vaccine design, antiviral drug design and antibiotics. And we'll look at some epidemiological trends and drug resistance that are applicable to uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, malaria, and some other pathogens. Um, so the important part of this program is that the program itself is a project-driven program. So we'll be talking about different methods, different applications, but we'll take examples of real data sets that you can find on NCBI uh, GIS aid and, and other repositories specific to different types of pathogens. And we will do a little bit of that today. So you'll get a sense of where you can find some data sets that might be interesting to you that might be related to the topic of your research. And we'll also take a look at some of the curated examples that we provide on our portal that will provide you with a launch board so you can start with your analysis with your research project in a very fast way. Before I continue, let me briefly uh, talk a little bit about myself. Uh, as Sonalika already mentioned, my name is Ilya Brodsky, and I've had a, a, an experience with hundreds of students across many campuses uh, supporting training in bioinformatics and helping students with minimal bioinformatic background apply methods of big data analysis to data sets that are interesting and uh, relevant to their research. And so I've had the privilege of running hundreds of online and on-site programs related to bioinformatics with our collaborators at Georgetown University, Louisiana State University, Tulane, University of Haifa, and many others. And as a result, I've seen hundreds of students from all backgrounds complete their training and get empowered by bioinformatics tools to participate in various research studies. So it's always exciting for me to see how someone that might have a research idea and is trained to use bioinformatics tools in a good way is then able to contribute to a real research problem. And the most exciting of these pro uh, projects are translational research projects that end up uh, leading to important changes in human health and disease. And so what I hope for you in this program is that these resources and this kind of training can also be helpful to you. And we're also looking to learn from you uh, to understand better what might be most relevant to you and most uh, interesting to you as well. 
And how do you think we can improve these programs by adding additional resources or providing you with one-on-one -on -one mentorship, which I will talk about in a little bit. So um, to kind of get started, we recently had a free webinar where we discussed some of the applications of next generation sequencing to uh, viral uh, infections, to different types of infectious diseases. Uh, so let me start by kind of recapping some of those topics, and this will give you an idea of, in general, where this program is headed. Uh, so as you know, in the last 20 years, uh, one of the things that has changed drastically is how easy it is to acquire genomic data. And, and there are multiple factors because of that. So some of the factors relate to how cheap it is to generate next generation sequencing data. There is a growing community of experts that are comfortable sharing their data more and more. So researchers and uh, research labs are easily sharing this data with others. There is also a growing uh, community of experts that can easily generate such data, which makes it much easier to go to different remote places around the world, generate high quality data, and really ask questions about different aspects of infectious diseases. So in application to uh, viral, uh, bacterial, as well as parasite caused infectious diseases, this is a growing resource that I think many of us can leverage as we see what's happening around us, like the pandemic right now, but also learn about other challenges to human health and disease. And so what this program is designed to do is kind of give you a sense of how different types of omics data could be used to understand and ask questions about different pathogens that you might be uh, aware of, that you might be interested, you, you might be researching. And it applies to analysis of genomic data, transcriptomic data, as well as structural data. So we'll talk a little bit about these examples uh, throughout the whole program. And today we'll talk about one aspect of that. We'll talk about next generation sequencing data analysis to find their uh, viral pathogens. But in general, it applies to viral genomics and evolution, uh, microbiome and infection. It also applies to immune response biomarkers on the host side using transcriptomic data analysis. It applies to drug resistance, population genetics to understand diversity in pathogens that are causing disease, and in uh, genome-wide association studies where we can measure the relationship between genomic variants and uh, phenotypes that we can capture. So we'll talk about all of these things throughout the program, but before we begin, so Malika already mentioned that to really participate in today's session and make the most out of the time that we have together, uh, we need to first get set up with the program and with the Omics Logic portal. So let me kind of take you through those steps again. Uh, maybe I could ask in the chat, how many of you have already registered on the Omics Logic portal? So maybe if you have registered, you can put number one. And then if you have not, put zero. And if you are putting zero, don't even put zero, just go to this link and create a free account. So it's really free of cost. And without this account, you will not be able to do the practical steps that we will do in just a little bit. And I don't want to um, wait for everyone Okay, so if you are having trouble registering, uh, if you could please um, email us, so you can email marketing at pine.io, and please specify what exactly is the problem that you're seeing, so maybe a screenshot, or what is your browser, anything like that. So if you have not, okay, the site is just blank. So maybe Mohit, you could let Suraj know and see what could be done about that. So please use uh, Google Chrome, if you can. Um, if it is not loading for you, maybe turn on the private window and try again. Okay, and I'm actually getting notifications as you're signing up. So I see that uh, quite a number of you are signing up. So I'm just going to give it just two more minutes and I'll explain how this is relevant to what we will be doing today. So first of all, you will see here on the site, 
what are the specific things that we are using in these programs? And these include some online training resources like tutorials. I'm not going to be going through a tutorial today, but you will see them on your own. We'll be talking about the logic of analysis, how to prepare specific pipelines that allow us to analyze big data. Okay, if you cannot sign in, there's actually a reset password uh, place where you can uh, reset your password. If I go to log in, you can see right here, send password reset. So you can use that to reset your password. All right, so um, again, what are, what are some of the things that we will leverage in today's session? We will use the pipeline builder. When you create an account on the portal, you will also get your password and that password could be used on this portal. So we will go there in just a few minutes. Some of the methods that we will be using today are based on scripts in R and Python. And so you'll find here some tutorials and I'll briefly speak about them in just a few minutes. And then we'll also talk about some curated data sets that you will be able to use. Now, this program is about infectious diseases, but those of you that are not interested in infectious diseases and have some other topic that you might be interested in, we recommend trying out some of these other tracks so you can see some of those here. Once you're logged in, I just want to briefly take you to the infectious diseases program page so that you can understand how that works. So you can go to the programs right here, and you will see that um, this is a program that I am already a part of. If you're not a part of this program, you can still see here some information. You won't be able to see everything. But if you have not logged in yet, you can explore some of the topics that we will be covering. And so this is how it's going to work. You will see here several important aspects like the overview of the program, which includes also the schedule. You'll see the courses that are included. And here's some of the courses that are, we are going to be using throughout this whole program. You will also see that you can book a meeting. So this is a meeting that you can schedule with a mentor. Right now it is with uh, Sonalika, who is our community manager. But once the program continues after today's session, we're going to have here an opportunity for you to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of the mentors. And I'll introduce one of the mentors today, Dr. Harpreet Kaur. When you book a meeting, you have to have uh, that level of subscription. So later on, Dr. Mohit Mazumdar will talk about different levels that you can access and how those vary by the features that you will get as a result of your registration. Also, we have a Slack channel. Okay, so those of you that are joining the program, you will be getting an email with all of the details of, about the different resources that you will have. And here you will see that the questions that you will have in the future about any of the topics that we discuss will be discussed right here. And it will be visible both, both on this page and in Slack itself. So Mohit and Sonalika, maybe you could add here all of the participants already. And once you complete the requirements of this program, which will include some theoretical, practical, and hands-on sessions, you will get a certificate of completion. So that certificate of completion is something that you'll be able to download. It will have your name here. It will have the program uh, training director, as well as the date right here. And once you have completed those, you can download this. It will also show up on your profile. So please take a look here as well. We also have options for uh, certificates of excellence. Certificates of excellence are issued for those that are going beyond the minimal. So they are actually interested in developing their own independent research projects. And so this is something that please take some time to uh, study, and then we'll cover this a little bit more. Now, right here, you can see that I have created my own profile. I've changed my profile image. I've made sure that my name is spelled correctly. All of these are important because it will be featured on your certificate. And you can also see 
that I have some points. And these points are going to be important for you to go through the program and make sure that we are aware of the things that you are completing. And so please take a look here. You will see some achievements, courses that you've completed, the lessons that you've completed, uh, the individual steps, and also code blocks that you will be running inside the training modules. So as you can see, this is my profile. Now you will see here, I've started posting some questions that you can see uh, at the bottom there of the page. And here are some of the courses that are included in this program. So these courses are going to give you an introduction, but also provide you with the context for the different project data sets that we're going to be leveraging throughout this program. If you ever go to the main page, you will be able to search for them. So for example, if you're interested in the Ebola virus, just search for Ebola and you will see that the recommendation will be included right here. What are some of the project data sets that we will be using in this program? We'll talk about the origins and pathogenesis of the novel coronavirus. So we'll talk about some hypotheses out there, where it has originated, and some of the methodology of how we can ask questions about origins and what are some of the tools that we have to find such information in the next generation sequencing data available online. We'll talk about tuberculosis, a disease that affects many millions of people around the world and is raising concern because of drug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis that we need to categorize and identify to be able to find appropriate treatments uh, for this kind of emerging resistant strains of tuberculosis. We'll use Ebola virus as one of our examples as well, because the genomic sequencing revolution in the area of infectious diseases really started with the epidemic in uh, 2014, 2016 for the Ebola virus in West Africa. And this is an example of a, an epidemic that rapidly spread, attracted the uh, visibility and attention of teams from around the world that basically uh, went there and started sequencing the viral and the host uh, samples to understand the spread and the potential uh, disease that this virus is going to cause. We'll also talk about some advanced methods of ultra deep sequencing where we can identify low frequency mutations and study populations of haplotypes within the host. And we'll also talk about some examples of how we can apply the same methods to track novel emerging pathogens that are appearing in host transcriptomes. So to talk about all of these topics, today is one of the sessions that we will cover many starting points that are going to be relevant for the rest of the program. So if you're joining just to learn about the program, I think you probably have enough information of what it's going to look like. And now we're going to transition to some practical hands-on exercises so that we can understand the data and then start asking about different questions from next generation sequencing data. So today I'll introduce you to next generation sequencing and talk a little bit about one example of what you can do with this kind of data. So as you know, the virome is one part of the microbiome and it constitutes all of the organisms that inhabit us. So all of the microorganisms that live in our gut, in our lungs, in our mouth, everywhere, uh, those could be divided into bacteria, fungi, but also viruses. And so when we talk about all of the viruses that are present in our body, a lot of these viruses are actually uh, harmless to human beings. They might affect the bacteria, so they could be uh, maybe even beneficial in some sense because they control uh, bacterial composition, but they also could find uh, their way into places that are not intended for them, that are not prepared for them. And so a lot of times when we speak about all of the viruses that are present in the host, we can call it the virome. Now, the size of the mammalian virome is actually not known. Although our own cells are outnumbered by our bacterial microbiome, the number of viruses may be even 10 times higher still than the microbiome. Human feces alone contain about 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th viruses per gram. 
and the mammalian virome is continuously updated through rapid evolution of viruses and through exposure to viruses in the environment or in other mammals. And so because there's such diversity, we have seen uh, an increase in the number of viruses that are studied from their genomic perspective. So we can see that primarily the viruses that are being characterized and studied using genomic sequencing are the viruses that cause disease. Even though there are many viruses out there, a lot of them are harmless. And the ones that we see a lot of new data coming out is always about the viruses that cause disease. And so one of the primary repositories for viral genomes is called the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI. And one of the portions of NCBI is called the GenBank. So this is an area on NCBI where all of these viral genomes are deposited. So if we just take a look at the current pandemic, you can see that the number of genomic sequences associated with the SARS-CoV-2 has been growing exponentially and at a much faster pace than many of the other viruses in previous pandemics. So you can see if we compare the number of genomes per month available on NCBI for SARS-1, it was just a few genomes per month. For Ebola, as I mentioned, one of the times that we saw in this dramatic increases in the number of genomic sequences available. It was over five genomes per month. If we take the range of the whole pandemic, 2014 to 2016. And then for COVID-19, this is data, I believe from 2020, you can see that the number of genomes per month that is made available on NCBI is continuing to grow at a dramatic pace. And what that tells us is that this area of viral next generation sequencing is a promising area of infectious disease research that is going to be driven by next generation sequencing technologies. And these technologies are also evolving and changing as we move on. So to talk a little bit about what they are, I think one of the major challenges in next generation sequencing is the amount of computational analysis that has to be done to extract meaningful information from this type of detailed data collection method. So typically the data is collected from a biological sample. And then there's an instrument called a sequencer that actually generates the data, the digital data. And then in between our ability to analyze this data, we have to what's called process this data. So we have to run bioinformatics pipelines that allow us to extract some meaning from the collection of digital data that these instruments produce. Now the instruments are sequencers, but they take in different types of biological samples. And these biological samples could be uh, prepared in different ways. They could be targeted sequencing, where library preparation techniques amplify for a specific pathogen or a specific gene using primers. They could be total DNA and RNA, where we use uh, specific primers to focus on a particular type of, uh, for example, DNA or RNA. We can take ribosomal uh, amplification, we can use depletion, but ultimately we are trying to focus on one, for example, the host, the human DNA or the human RNA, and we are able to um, look at all of the variation of that host. Okay, if somebody cannot see the screen, um, I'm sorry about that, maybe you could rejoin. And um, for me, it's saying that I am showing the screen. Now, the other approach is to look at amplicon or environmental type sequences. So the way that works is we actually take a look at specific type of uh, RNA. For example, the 16S ribosomal RNA would allow us to study diversity and composition of bacterial uh, samples present in our environmental sample. So to learn about this, we have prepared a collection of articles that talk about different sequencing methods and approaches, and we will share those links on the Slack channel after today's session. So if anyone is interested to learn more, we will be providing some literature and you will be able to continue and expand your knowledge about different techniques for uh, different types of 
methods of sequencing. Let me take a look at some of the questions here. Um, when we take targeted sequence and when we take total DNA RNA? Okay, so that's a good question. Today, we're going to look at one of the examples. And so when we look at that example, you'll kind of see the use case for different types of techniques. Is this applicable in the Philippines? I believe this is, this is an online program. So anyone from around the world can join and practice using the same tool. So if your internet connection is stable and if you're able to join our meetings live like today or view the recorded sessions, you can also do that on your own time. So when we speak about viral or bacterial sequencing, uh, a lot of times we can look at either strains that we can grow in, back in the lab where we can identify specific variation in bacterial genomic data of a, a strain or multiple strains, right? So that's the objective and that is called uh, culture-based sequencing. So we essentially grow the bacteria in a culture and then those cultured bacteria could be sequenced and we can perform genomic analysis of that DNA. Sometimes we don't know the bacteria that we're looking for, and we're interested in looking at the whole composition. So we're interested to look at the different types of bacteria that are present. And so that's when we use culture-free sequencing methods or environmental sequences, and then we can classify them. We can organize them by their taxonomic uh, belonging. So where are they in the taxonomy and what are the differences in composition between different samples? Okay, so May is asking when we use 16S RNA, do we target only living bacteria? Yes, typically you take a sample from a bacterial sample that is either living or it could be dead bacteria. Of course, the RNA is going to degrade for a long time, so you have to preserve it somehow. But then when you sequence, you can extract different types of information. 16S for ribosomal RNA, you can extract taxonomy. For all whole RNA or DNA, you can actually look at the complete genome and all the variants from other types of bacteria. Now, when it comes to viruses, it's a little bit different. We can also look at specific viral samples to understand what are the prevalent species in the data that we collected. For example, if we use a sample from a, an infected patient, we can then ask the question, how is a particular virus infecting this patient different from the reference that we have? Or sometimes we can actually look at the whole RNA and DNA from the host and ask the question, what kinds of viruses are actually present in a given sample, in the given patient, right? So those are two very different questions, but we can still look at those two perspectives to really understand how this works. Now, to give you a practical example, let me introduce you to a resource for metagenomic sequencing. We'll use this as our first exercise. So if you go on the Learn portal right here to Courses, and you search for metagenomics. Here we have some introductory course material where you will find information on how microbiome sequencing is done, what is the microbiome role in human health, how do you visualize 16S ribosomal RNA metagenomic data, how do you analyze it for uh, composition and things like that. And so here you will see a lot of coursework that you can go through to learn about different methods of annotation of such next generation sequencing data for microbiome composition studies, okay? Now, from this example, we're going to look at just one of those examples. We're not going to look at microbiome samples. We're actually going to look at a host sample that contains a viral genome. And to do that, and this is one of the exercises that you will find here, but to do that, we are going to go to the tBioInfo platform. And this way, all of you can participate in the hands-on assignment that we will do together. So please go with me to this link and let me know once you are logged in. So if you're logged in, you will see that your name should be over here. 
And to log in, you will be able to use the same password that you registered with on the learnomicslogic.com portal. So if you have your account and you're signed in, please put number one in the chat box. And I'll give a few minutes to everyone to log in. If you have not created an account yet, then you can create an account really quickly and just use the same password. So may, maybe you could take a look at creating an account on learn omicslogic.com. It's a free process. And then you'll be able to use that here as well. Okay, Vikas, the same thing. If you could create an account, then you will be able to follow along. I'll just give it 30 more seconds. All right, great. So the first thing that we will do is we'll actually take a look at this first section right here. And there's a drop down right here where you can see how we will take a sample from a host. You will see this demo SF9 unmap reads. We are taking here a total RNA sequencing data from the host. And so you can click on start. Oh, sorry, not this one, not this demo. Let's go to this first demo. Okay, and we'll take a look at the host data. I'm gonna click on start. Bowtie 2G and visualization. Okay, and so we will just take a look at what does this data look like? Okay, now if you are logged in, I'm just going to be able to, I think, give you this link. And if you didn't create the same pipeline, you can just click on this link and go there from your computer. And then we can click on this link called visualization. And so this is, uh, this is JBrowse. So this is a browser that allows us to see individual sequencing reads. Okay, so here you can see these little dots. These are actually reads. Okay, and so if we zoom in, you'll start seeing that each one of these, you can click on them, and you can see that this is a read. It contains a quality score for each letter in the sequence. And here's the actual sequence. So the reads are 150 nucleotides long. This is the actual sequence of each read. And this is their quality. And down below here, if you get out of that window, you will see the coverage. So what is coverage? The coverage is just the amount of reads per position or over here, you can actually see the stack that reads. Okay, let's repeat the procedure again together. All right, so just so that I know how many of you are following along. So if you're following along, let me know in chat. We'll see how many of you are still here. I'm gonna go right here to demo RNA-seq cell line project. All right, thank you, Petra. Once you're here, you'll see that the buttons start highlighting the methods that you can select. So the first thing that we need to do to start the pipeline, click on start. Now the pipeline is for RNA-seq data analysis. Okay, so Kufre, um, you need to just log in. Once you're logged in, you go to areas of analysis, click on this drop down, select this demo pipeline, click on start. And now you see several options highlight. So the highlighted options are the different types of pipelines that you can run on this data. And the one that we want to do is we want to map the data that we have. This is total RNA sequencing. 
map it on the host genome. So that's why we'll use bowtie 2G. And then we'll visualize the produced BAM files. So these files contain all of the start and, and the actual sequence of reads that we have in our data. So click on visualization. And then you can complete your pipeline. So that means your pipeline is ready. So once your pipeline is ready, you'll have this link for visualization. Okay, so Amartya, um, just making sure, have you been able to, to run this pipeline? Hello, ST. Yes, good to see you here as well. Okay, so now you have this link for visualization. You click on visualization and you will see the reads stacked up aligned to the reference genome. So right here you see the reference genome on top. What is this reference genome? Okay, so if you click right here, you'll see that there are many uh, different things here mentioned, right? What is this? If you actually take this, you can see on NCBI what this is. So let's go to NCBI. And right here, we can just search for this. Okay, what is this? This is Spotoptera frugiperda. It's a, uh, okay, so it's a whole genome. So this is something that we can uh, read a little bit more over here. SF9 is a cell line that is used for production of different biologics. So when they make different proteins like insulin or different vaccines even, a lot of times they're grown in insect cells. And these insect cells can also get infected by viruses. And so a major concern is when we see viruses that could also cause human infection. Because if you produce vaccines or biologics that are later on used to treat people, but they have contamination, it's a huge concern. And so this example that we're doing together is from an FDA uh, for the NIH uh, kind of uh, dealing with FDA projects that are concerned with contamination in these kinds of cell line cultures. And so what they have found is that these cell lines could get contaminated. And the question is with what kinds of viruses? So the first thing that we can do is we can map the reads onto the reference genome. And the second thing that we can do in our pipeline is we can actually look at all of our data and get from this data information about reads that are not mapped to the reference genome. Okay, so now let's go to another section. And now we can analyze the data where we take all of the unmapped reads and map them onto a database of all the viruses. Okay, so we're, we're gonna go right here, again, on the areas of analysis, go to metagenomics microbiome, and we're going to go to SF9 mapping on viral database. Okay, so we're gonna map the reads onto the viral database and see what kind of viruses we can actually find. Go to bow to bow type to align, pause count, names replace, and, and now we will get some files, okay? So the file you want to take from here is this one, SF9 not map database viruses table after annotation. Once we take this file, what do we see in this data set? Just open an Excel real quick.
Okay, so here we have viral genomes. You can see again, they're from NCBI mapped to from these reads, right? So some of these reads map this uh, to uh, some of these viral genomes. Okay, and Sayeda is asking how this demo will help us prepare for original projects. Well, before you start your original project, you have to know what you're doing. And so all of the methods that we're doing today are demo because we don't have to deal with uploading data and thinking about what kind of analysis to do. We're actually going to use some of these curated examples. But once you're trained and you understand how this analysis is done, then you can go and find your own data and perform similar analysis because now you know what it does and what kind of inputs and outputs are required to be able to run this kind of analysis. Okay, so just briefly, I'm going to sort this, sorry, from largest to smallest. And I can see that the largest one that has over uh, 100,000 reads is this genome, right? So I can go and check what kind of a genome is this. Go here, go to all databases and look for this gene. Again, you can see that one of the more abundant uh, genomes is this uh, granulovirus. Okay, and this granulovirus is something that we actually expect to find because it is being used in the actual production using these cell lines, right? So this kind of gives you a sense of how do you actually take sequencing data, which is digital data about some biological process that is captured in real time, and then analyze this data using different methods and tools to be able to extract some meaningful information. It's structured, right? You can ask questions about this data. And so using such examples, Today is the first session, so we're obviously not doing a lot of finding new data sets and looking for different types of uh, analysis that we can do. We can start understanding what does this data represent and how can we actually analyze this data and get some meaningful insights. So now is the time if you have any questions, let's talk about what kind of questions you might have about what we just covered. So again, what did we cover? We covered different applications of next generation sequencing data to study infectious diseases, including bacterial, pathogen from parasites and viral diseases. So these types of diseases all could be studied using next generation sequencing data. And in this uh, program, we will talk about different methods of analysis, provide you with examples, and show you where to find data that you could use to prepare independent projects. Number two, we talked about resources that you can find that explain the methods of analysis, that explain, give the context for different projects, and also how you can interact with all of us, the mentors of this program, so that you can ask questions and get help with your independent project. And number three, we talked about some of the tools that we have. And some of the tools include uh, some of the methods of analysis that you just saw me demonstrate that show you how to use the methods for big data analysis and how to use some of the examples that we have prepared. And also we talked uh, about how to um, use downstream analysis methods for data visualization and statistical analysis in R and Python. And so at the end of today's session, we will actually show you how to do that as well on the learnomicslogic.com portal. But, uh, okay, so um, there's a question about the recording. Yes, you will get the recording and the recording is already available on our YouTube channel. So let me just briefly show you how this will work in the program itself. For those of you that are already registered, you can see this is today's session. And right here, you can see this session video. So this video is already a recording of today's session. So you can just see it right here. 